actually introduce you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'd like to introduce a very special person. This is Professor Jenny Gregory, and she's here today to talk to us about the Garden Empires. Mm -hmm. So please take it away, Jenny. Thanks very much indeed, Kerry Ann. Okay. Okay, thanks very much for inviting me. It's always great to, you know, come out from the university into the local community and talk about things that matter to people in the, the community. And you've got a special community here, um, particularly in view of the early development of this area, which is quite special to the extent that it is, is featured um, in a book that was written by a colleague of mine back in the 80s, Robert Freestone at the University of New South Wales. He wrote about the Garden City movement in Australia, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, he spoke about, uh, he talked about this, and some of the examples in this book are from this area. So that, you know, puts this place on the Australian map and also on the international map as an example of the work of the Garden City movement. So, um, I don't know whether you've got this in the library, and it's probably out of print now, but it's a terrific book. So, what I'm going to talk about today, it's got um, two sections to this story. The first section is about the Garden City movement in the early part of the 20th century. The second section is about the 1950s and the impact. So, you know, that kind of bookends. Um, and the other, in, the interesting thing about it is how much developments in Britain and Europe had an effect on what actually developed here. So I'll first of all talk a little bit about that, then move on to garden cities and garden suburbs, then to modernism in 50s Perth, and then of course to the Empire Games Village. So just to give you a bit of a sense, um, as some of you would be aware, the 19th a late 18th, early 19th century in Britain was marked by massive population increase, by urbanisation, people moving from the country into the city. And why were they doing that? Because of the development of factories. And I guess you all remember learning at school about Arkwright and um, the steam engine and I remember the spinning jenny because that's my name. Um, so all that's going on in Britain and the empire is developing. They're bringing goods from all over the empire to the mills of England, mills and potteries of England, churning out all this mass production, which is great for the economy, but the conditions in which people who'd moved into the cities to work in the factories the conditions in which they were living were pretty terrible. And many of you will know the hymn, and did these feet in ancient times walk upon England's green and pleasant, oh, I can't remember the words exactly, but it talks about the dark satanic mills, that top image, that's a factory in England, and these were you know, not very pleasant places to work in, to say the least. But as a result of that movement and the industry and the smoke and the pollution, etc., there's a revolt against that, an intellectual revolt against that. You can see it in poetry. Many of us will remember learning Wordsworth's daffodils at school. Images of rural Britain, um, the green and pleasant land that's spoken about in that hymn. Um, so there's a real nostalgia for this golden age in the past. So there's nostalgia, but there are also very real reasons for thinking very positively about that in terms of health and the environment in contrast to the urban, polluted, industrial um, situations. Now, Ebenezer Howard was um, a man who was living in this period of England and he was really interested in, well, he, he was a reformer. He wanted to improve the conditions of people in England, to get them out of these polluted cities, etc. So he created the idea of the garden city. And the garden city, this is um, 1898 from a book he wrote about it, um, was actually a city where it was zoned. So you'd have the industry in one area, um, you'd have housing and shopping in another area, 
but a mark of it would be gardens, gardens and parkland in these cities. And as a result of his work and um, other advocates, they formed a Garden Cities Association in Britain, had conferences to which people in Australia went to you know, hear what the latest was in pl the planning of cities. Um, and there's also a guy called Raymond Unwin, Unwin who was also very influential, who wrote another book, Nothing Gained by Overcrowding. Again, that was um, an attempt to convince people that it's, or convince those who were in power, I guess, um, county councils, governments, etc., that people shouldn't be living in these narrow tenements in overcrowded situations. They needed for health, um, they needed a better environment. And that had become particularly evident in Britain in the late 19th century when Britain got involved in the Boer War in Africa, in South Africa, um, because many of those people who signed up to go in the army had to be rejected because they were small, they were thin, they were weedy, they were unhealthy. And this is when Britain started getting really worried about the health of its people. So hence the Garden City movement is going to improve the health of the nation. Now, um, it's promoted all over the place, um, particularly uh, th through that Garden City Association. They send people around the world promoting the idea of the Garden City. And this guy on the right, uh, Charles Reed, came out here and did a tour of Australia in 1914, just before the First World War. Um, that's the free public lectures, that's the poster they had. Um, free public lecture illustrated by, how many? A thousand slides. <laughs> so the most recent pictures and diagrams from Great Britain, Europe and America showing as lucidly as possible value as valuable aspects and experience gained in the Garden City movement which has made such rapid advances in recent years. So what he's essentially promoting, <coughs> he's promoting Garden Cities as an environmental ideal that will incorporate parks and open spaces and they'll be used for recreation but they'll also allow the people to connect with nature. And I think in these times when we are very aware of um, environmental issues that's got particular resonance. resonance. Now at the same time um, W.E. Bold, Billy Bold, who was the long time city uh, town clerk of the city of Perth, he went on several overseas trips, um, you know, looking around at what's being done in other places in the world and bringing ideas back to Perth. And one of the things he promoted after a tour of the US was the notion of boulevards. And what have we got here behind us? We've got the boulevard. And up the end of the boulevard where the lights are, what have we got? We've got a park area. I always thought that was a slightly useless park, personally, actually, because nothing ever seems to happen on it. But it's certainly a green and pleasant space. So the boulevards, um, the idea of them was to make parks accessible, connect parks, and use land that wasn't required for traffic for flower beds, shrubberies, etc., to improve the, the aesthetics of the environment, really. Um, so all this movement is really gathering pace in Perth, and um, as a result of that, in 1920, the city of Perth um, endowments Lands Act, so covering the lands out this way towards City Beach, all this land um, is passed, and then Hope and Clem, the surveyors, who I'll talk about later, um, develop a project around that in 1925. And this is um, a plan, you probably can't see it very well, um, of their plan in 1925 uh, actually, uh, their master plan for the area. And you can see here you've got Rearbold Hill, you know, this spotty bit down there, Parkland, and the um, Perry Lakes. And then you've got the design for Floriot over on the right following Garden City principles with parkland interspersed and then the city beach endowment lands um, as well. Now things don't get built exactly um, as is planned ever I don't think. 
Uh, we all know about the, the great designs we see appearing in the newspaper for various projects and we all know that you know, along the road there are some changes. So there were changes with this too. But you can see very clearly the way in which the Garden City movement is influencing, particularly through parks and also for, through curved streets. Rather than just having you know, a grid like that, you've got the idea of the curved streets and then you can utilise the plan so that you can get gardens in there as well. Um, and that's um, Percy Hope at the top. I mean, obviously photographed much later than the 1920s and Carl Clem below. Um, they were actually brother-in-laws um, and they worked together in this, um, in this surveying company. It's, it was really very progressive because it picked up all these garden city, garden suburbs ideas. And um, there's um, an area that they subdivided in Victoria Park. There's the middle of Dalkeith where Circe Circle is. Again, you know, so, uh, with garden city ideas, except what happened there is they built a school in the middle, which would have originally been a park, but it is a, a green area for the community. Um, a number, and this is their plan for the very first subdivision in um, Floriet Park. And as you can see, all the lots back on to this central area, which is a park area. I don't know whether that's still like that, is it? Anyone know? Are there? Are there? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are also areas in Mount Lawley and Coolbinia that are like this too. They've got this internal park, um, you know, out the backyard, which must be fantastic for parents and families and children because there's a safe place, presumably, where children can play and it can be a real community, bring the community together. Um, so this is the first... Um, pamphlet for it, 23 home sites around a central reserve. And associated with this was a model house competition. Um, they had this competition in 1933 and this is the winning design by someone called H. H. Bonner, B-O-W-N-E-R. Um, I don't know whether this was actually built but I do know there are other model houses. There's one up towards the lights on the boulevard um, and there is another one somewhere around here. And number, number 6 and number 12. Number 6 and 12 and one of them was for sale just recently. I seem to remember seeing in the papers and thinking, oh I must go and have a look at that but I don't know whether it's still for sale. Um, and they're different from this, they're quite different in their design from, from this particular one. Um, yes, yeah, so, so they wanted to make sure that in this new subdivision they had quality homes built and homes where there would be a competition and a sense of excellence in the housing style according to the you know, design principles of the time. Um, and then that's the approved plan for the whole of Floriet Park. I'm sorry this is a bit, actually a bit small for you to see. Um, that's uh, 1937 and it's based on, I mean it's obviously things have been amended but it's based on the recommendations of um, Hope and Clem. And you can see if you look closely at these, there are park areas interspersed throughout um, the areas, the notion of the curvilinear streets, um, etc. Um, and it provided for 1,500 home sites around a central community area, I guess that's right here, um, and divided into three neighbourhoods. So that's Floriet Park as a garden suburb. Now to jump. I'm jumping now to the 1950s. We've left the 30s behind, the Great Depression, World War II, and now we're moving into post-war development, the kind of tremendous enthusiasm that many people have had in that post-war period. Many veterans had come back from the war had seen, some of them had seen the devastation in Europe and Britain and were really committed to building a new society and there were movements like moral rearmament um, and the engineers um, are very influential at that time because to fuel this development, to, to build a new world if you like, you need 
industrial development to make it happen. And this is the plan of Konana, a long way from Florida, but it's very important. Um, there was a deal struck between the uh, what became BP, British Petroleum, to build a refinery here, Middle Eastern oil brought to Konana refinery here, which would, I don't know, refine it and turn it into petrol for cars, you know, fuel, etc. And clustered around these, of course, came other industries. Now, um, you've got the industries here. If you're going to have industry, you've got to have a workforce. Post-war immigration is beginning, particularly British immigration, and the areas of Medina, Callista, Palmyra were all subdivided, and Konana, um, a town planner called Margaret Fieldman did a huge amount of work on, on these. And these were to house particularly British immigrants. BP had to put some money into all this, of course, and the government put a lot of money in, and to house British I immigrants who would work in these factories. And that was really the beginning of you know, the post-war industrial boom in Western Australia. Um, where industry began to you know, move up a notch, whereas previously we'd been very much dependent on wheat and sheep, really, apart from gold earlier on. <coughs> now, OK, so you've got the sense that Perth's on the cusp of movement, but Perth at that time was tiny, really tiny. It only, this is a map um, from a plan for the metropolitan region, which was drawn up in 1955. And at that stage, the Hatch area um, in the south just went to about South Fremantle, Coogee, and in the north it went to um, not very far at all. Um, I'm just struggling, sort of the Sterling, pardon? Yes, Sorrento, that's right. And the dome at Sorrento was kind of the end of the line. Um, so, and then the hills, of course, provide the um, eastern boundary. Um, so, they knew there was, industri there was industrial expansion, there was immigration, immigrants coming in. Where were these people going to be lived? Li live? We're going to have to plan the city. Again, they get back to the notion of planning properly. And they bring out um, a British town planner from the University of Liverpool, Gordon Stevenson who later, uh, he goes to Canada, he goes to various places, but he later comes back here permanently and becomes the Foundation Professor of Architecture at UWA. Um, but he, he has had considerable experience. He worked um, on the post-war reconstruction of London, because of course, as you know, London was really badly bombed during the war. So he worked on the reconstruction and planning of that and gain considerable experience, comes out here, develops this metropolitan plan for the whole region. I won't go into the details of this, but there's a real sense things are happening. The Narrows Bridge gets um, built around this time in the late 50s. Perth gets an international airport, which is pretty specky at that time. I seem to remember there were even black swans in a pond out there, which looked pretty scary. <laughs> Um, and we get, begin to get modern architecture in Perth. Does anyone remember this in the Supreme Court gardens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Very sadly, it was demolished. Um, it was terrific. Um, but it caused a great deal of controversy when it went up in the 50s. Um, some people said it was astonishing, a wicked waste of materials and labour. But the architect, Eric Leach, said, whether or not it achieves beauty is not for me to say. So much depends on the eye of the beholder or the awareness of the, cri of the critic. But interestingly, within a year, he'd left Perth and <laughs> gone to the UK. So it was a bit much for Perth in um, that period. But it's pretty, pretty spectacular when you think about it. And of course, perhaps some of you can tell me what some of these buildings are. What's the what's this one?